Hello and welcome to lesson three, which is glaciers. Um, so the focus question today I want you guys to think about is um, what happens to the rock that is carved out of landscapes by glaciers? So what happens, um, what are the glaciers look like? Um, what does the landscape look like after a glacier goes through? Um, new vocabulary, I'm gonna skip through that. Um, you guys have your vocabulary on your city guide. All right, um, so latitude, um, just a reminder, latitude is um, this that goes, let me get my little pointer. Um, so latitude is basically um, this right here. So they're horizontal, whoops. All right, um, so latitude here, um, you can see right here is basically um, horizontal. So they're horizontal surfaces. Um, and longitude is the um, up and down. So latitude, they're all horizontal. They're never touching. Um, they run north of the equator or they run south of the equator. Um, and then longitude, of course, is east and west. Um, so longitude line, um, that was the zero degree was the prime meridian. And then it's either west or east. Um, so we've had some experience using latitude, longitude with our maps that we've done. All right, so if we look at a glacier, um, a glacier is basically a mass of ice and it's moving down um, through, this is considered to be an alpine glacier, so it's moving down through the mountains. And then once it gets into this valley area, it's considered to be a valley glacier. Um, but they cover about 10% of the Earth's surface and they scour and erode the rock. And this is what eventually forms our U-shaped valleys. Um, so we get this nice U shape because of this glacier kind of wearing away and eating away at this rock. All right, um, so during the last ice age, we had glaciers come down um, basically from um, the North Pole and they came down all the way through this area. So you can see um, glaciers the last 18,000 years ago um, and then glaciers present would be the lighter white. So glaciers, presently we've got glaciers in Greenland, which is, this is Greenland, um, and then other northern parts of Europe. Um, we've got a few glaciers, this is in the Himalayas, and then a few of the mountain ranges, and of course, Antarctica. So that's where we have glaciers today. Um, but glaciers 18,000 years ago um, covered quite a bit. So they came down all the way through North America and covered um, quite a bit of Europe. And then of course they extended out um, and made Antarctica bigger than it is today. All right, so we've got two kinds of glaciers. I kind of um, touched lightly on one of them, um, but we've got um, continental glaciers and then we've got valley and alpine glaciers. Um, so continental glaciers, you can see here, um, continental glaciers are um, basically covering the continent. Um, so you can see this is um, Greenland and this is Antarctica. And, uh, and so they cover the entire continent. Um, that would be a continental, continental glacier. All right, so both valley and continental glaciers, um, they move outward and they travel downhill. Um, so there's um, a couple different areas that they have. They have areas of accumulation. So that's where the snow accumulates. So that's where it's growing. Um, and then they have places where it's, um, it is receding faster than it's accumulating. Um, so that would be areas um, at the bottom of accumulation. So that's where it's getting smaller. Um, and so I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, so here we've got the accumulation zone, which is right here that I was talking about. So we've got um, more snow being added than is melting. And so that would be where it's accumulating. And that's usually up in higher elevations. And then you've got this ablation zone here. Um, so ablation is where it's melting faster than it's accumulating. And so in times of ice ages, this line, this equilibrium line here, will migrate um, down and the glacier will grow. And then we've got um, times of global warming where this equilibrium line will um, go up higher. And so the glacier will be receding. So the ablation would be um, greater in times of warmer temperature and accumulating in times of cooler temperature. In the winter, this line would move down and the um, glacier would grow. And in the summertime, the glacier would shrink. And so it's not necessarily moving uphill, but it kind of seems like it's moving uphill because it's melting. And so the glacier might only extend down to this far um, versus this far. All right, so with erosion, ooh, I made my picture bigger. Um, that is not what I wanted to do. 
make it smaller there. All right, so um, so as far as um, erosion goes, um, you can see here um, it's sliding and scratching through the rock um, and it's causing erosion. So, um, so as it's moving downhill, it's picking up rocks and those rocks are abrading just like a river does when they pick up um, river rock and sand and it bumps and grinds on the other rock and basically causes those rocks to be rounded and smooth like we've seen. Um, so it's doing the same thing except for it kind of in a slow motion and it makes distinct um, lines in the rock. So this process is called plucking. And so basically it's taking these little rocks out of the bedrock and then it's moving them down. Um, and eventually it'll accumulate the bottom in a whole bunch of um, sediment at the bottom. All right, so here's what that looks like. So this is evidence of a glacier. So the only thing that causes this on rock are glaciers. And so we can tell that the glacier moved in this direction, generally in this direction. So we've got some sideways scratching occurring. So the glacier is generally probably moving down um, in a, you know, like a, a several different ways, but it's not moving across. So it's not moving from left to right in this picture. It is moving either from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. I don't know. Um, I can't tell what's uphill and what's downhill in this picture, but, uh, but it's generally moving um, not left to right, but up and down in this picture. And then there's been plucking occurring. So you can see there's some um, rocks that have been removed here. And then you can see some rocks here. Um, those have been scratched um, probably along the surface. So this is definitely evidence of glaciers. So we can tell where glaciers have been in the, in the past um, during the last ice age by looking at rocks like this. If you were to go to um, Yellowstone, or not Yellowstone, but Yosemite National Park, um, here in California, you would see a lot of this evidence. So any U-shaped valley, you would see a lot of evidence of um, glacial erosion, and this would be some evidence there. All right, so glaciers, um, they, um, up at high elevations, they create different features that we see, and one is called a cirque. So the Trinity Alps, um, there's, I went hiking this summer, and there's so many cirques. So the lakes up there, there's lakes everywhere and they're all in the bowls of rocks surrounding them. And those are basically cirque lakes. So they freeze over in the winter and then in the summer they melt um, and they are kind of in bowl, a bowl shape. And those are cirques. And I'll show you a picture here in a minute. And then what they do on the tops of the rocks is they slide down the surfaces and they create horns. So, um, and they also form hanging valleys. So let me go back. Um, a hanging valley, so right here, um, hanging valley. Uh, Yosemite is a really good example of this. So a U-shaped valley creates kind of steep um, cliffs on the side. That's why on the worksheet that you guys did, um, we saw a lot of landslides on one of the sides. And that's because of that hanging valley. So if you go ever go to Yosemite, um, there is hanging cliffs, hanging valley. And so the valley's down below and then you've got these steep cliffs and there's tons of waterfalls there. And that's because the water coming off travels down uh, the cliff and it has nowhere to go except for to fall. So we get lots of waterfalls. Um, and then I included this picture because this is a, a great example of a bowl shape. So a cirque. Um, this is the old ski park. So um, not even I have been here, but sorry, you guys probably haven't been here except for maybe in the summer you can drive up to it. Um, and it's where the old ski park used to be. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, it'd be, I guess it was in its time, it was the biggest ski park in the US um, was here at Mount Shasta. And so it was much higher in elevation. I think this is somewhere around 6,000, 7,000 feet in elevation. And so they got tons of snow all the time. Um, throughout the winter. So it wasn't as big of a problem of snow as it is now because they moved it down to lower elevations. Um, but you can see the ski lift going way up here and you can ski all over the place. Um, you can see all the lines that people have done. Um, and so anyways, they uh, they had lots of avalanches. So they constantly had um, trouble with avalanches and there was an avalanche that ended up wiping out this um, lift. And so they basically shut it down because it was too costly to keep it up. Um, but I guess it was um, like renowned in the U.S. Like people knew about it from all over and they would come here to ski kind of like they do in Colorado now. Uh, so that's kind of cool. But uh, but anyways, so that is um, the Old Ski Bowl out in Shasta. All right. And this is a famous um, horn that's formed from glaciers. So think about what 
this looks like. So um, a lot of you might recognize this. I'll give you guys a minute. So if you guess the Matterhorn at Disneyland, you're right. Um, so this is the Matterhorn, and this is the real Matterhorn. And so the Matterhorn at Disneyland looks pretty much exactly the same, except for obviously on a smaller scale. But um, but this is formed from glaciers. So glaciers came down and carved this. And then you've got these, um, so this would be an alpine glacier, and then this would be a valley glacier coming down. Um, and then this is below the snow level. So in the winter, this would be covered with snow. Um, but in the summertime, you can see even this is covered with glaciers still because it's high in elevation. But this is a perfect example of a horn shape. Um, that's formed from glaciers. So the Matterhorn is named for that. All right, so um, as far as deposition goes, um, we can tell where glaciers have been because of what they deposit. So this deposit here is called a moraine. And so you can see there's a lot of till, it's called glacial till. And so it's all this rock and debris that's brought down from the glacier. And you can see where the glacier came right in here. Um, and so all of that is brought down into this area. And then when the glacier stops moving downhill, and it starts to retreat when it starts to melt, it carries all that, um, or I mean not carries, but it um, the snow melts, and then it leaves all that stuff behind. So all of that uh, material is left behind in um, at the bottom. And so we can tell where it's been. And then you can see um, several glaciers are merging. So um, they are coming down the mountain here. And then notice their um, moraines. So there's these um, lateral moraines. And so this is formed from this material coming down like this and being deposited. And then this material is coming down here and being deposited. And so it's joining together um, to form this kind of lateral moraine. Um, and then down at the bottom, we might get a larger moraine like what's on here on the left. Oh, I think I went too far. All right, and then at the very bottom, um, this is an outwash plain. Um, so basically an outwash plain, let me move my picture a little bit. I'm trying to make it smaller here. All right, so kind of slide it over here, I guess. All right, so um, so you can see here, um, this is the outwash plain. So as the glacier melts, um, it's it basically that melt water comes out and it forms this outwash um, plain. So this is a plain, a flat area, and outwash just means all the glacial melt. And so this is all the till and all the unsorted material that the glacier is depositing. And then all the melt water, and this is probably summertime, so things are melting and, uh, and basically um, washing down into the valley. Um, and so that's when a glacier is retreating, it's going to melt in the summer. And then when it's not retreating, it's going to, this might freeze over and, uh, and then the glacier will advance, um, in the winter time. And then it'll repeat that process again and again. All right. So depositions, um, some more deposition, um, we've got different features. Um, there are drumlins, um, drumlins are these here, so they're kind of this teardrop shape mound, um, and we can tell how they formed or where the glaciers came. The glaciers basically moved from left to right, so it moved from here over to here, and that's because we can see that deposit, that deposition. Uh, we can tell which direction the glacier came from and where it went. And then here we can see um, these are um, eskers. So we can see these different eskers, which are the different um, like hill. They kind of look like the um, longitudinal uh, dunes that we talked about last time, um, but they aren't. So these are not definitely where um, sand dunes would be. Um, this is in the Midwest. Um, a lot of Minnesota, it looks like this. And so these eskers are formed by, they're kind of like the moraines. Um, so they're ridges that are formed under the meltwater. And then a came is this. So it's kind of just this mound um, of sediment um, that's deposited um, as glaciers um, move and maybe scour this land, but deposit this as they start to melt. All right, so a continental glacier is a little bit different. We talked about valley and alpine glaciers just a minute ago. Um, so continental glaciers cover the entire continent. And so they, um, like Antarctica or Greenland. And so you've got the bedrock here. Um, and notice how we've got these different um, types of things forming. So this was like the Midwest, for example. So here we've got our um, drumlins. So we just saw that in the last picture. Um, here's our eskers. Uh, we've got our moraines. This is a terminal moraine, meaning that it's at the end. 
Um, and then we've got our cames, which are the little mounds. And this glacier is retreating. So here's our outwash plain. And so, um, so this is going up north because it's colder up north. So this is the south to the bottom here. And so when we go back and we look at the Midwest now, we can tell how far the glaciers came down because we can see these types of features. And these features tell us where the glacier went. So this moraine is the bottom of the glacier. And so it didn't go down any farther than that. Um, and we can see those in um, all of the different areas that we've had glaciers at. And so as the glacier retreats, just meaning that it's melting, it leaves behind these different types of features and we can tell um, where it's been. All right, so kettles, um, kettles are really common. Um, this, these are kettle lakes. And so um, Minnesota is known as the land of a thousand lakes. And the reason it's known as a land of a thousand lakes is because it used to be covered by glaciers. And so the glaciers carved out these little areas. And then basically when they melted, they left these lakes behind. The Great Lakes are humongous kettles, um, but they are kettle lakes um, that are formed from glaciers. So they're just huge lakes, but they were formed from the glacial meltwater. And the glaciers are so heavy that they tend to cause depressions. And then those depressions um, fill with meltwater uh, and then they form lakes. And so you've got these, you know, area that are just covered with lakes because of this. Um, so this is also how the Cirque Lakes and the Trinity Alps um, that I was talking about, that's how they form too. Um, it, except for it's a Cirque shape because there's mountains around. Um, in this case, there aren't mountains. Um, but these little lakes form because you've got all this meltwater occurring. Um, so that would be how these form. And same with the Trinity Alps, um, just you have mountains instead. <laughs> Let's take a look at glaciers. What exactly are glaciers? Glaciers are simply bodies of ice that form from repeated periods of snowfall. Once they form, they are pulled very slowly downhill by gravity. There are generally two types of glaciers. First, we have alpine glaciers, which form high up in the mountains and travel downhill like rivers of ice. Then we have continental glaciers. These are massive glaciers that cover entire land masses, and they tend to move outwards from the center, often towards the coastline. Let's see what these look like. Here's an alpine glacier, and you can see it looks just like a river of ice. All of these flowing slowly downhill, carving out the rock as they go. A great example of a continental glacier would be Antarctica. It's this huge, thick sheet of ice that covers virtually the entire landmass. We see a similar thing in Greenland. Up close, you can see these huge sheets of ice ooze out from the center towards the coastline, slowly grinding away the rock beneath. When either type of glacier, whether it be alpine or continental, when they reach the ocean, large chunks of the ice tend to break off, and this is a process that's known as calving, and you can see it happening here. As climate change continues and the atmosphere and oceans are warmed, calving is happening at a faster rate. These big chunks that fall off of the glaciers then float out into the sea, becoming icebergs. The most important thing to look at with glaciers is how they impact the landscape. That is, how do they change the land as they grind over the surface over millions of years? First and foremost, we should know that glaciers grind down the rock that's on both sides and on the bottom of the area where they're moving, and the result is this large U-shaped valley, which you can see here in the diagram. Notice it's shaped like the letter U. Here's what it looks like in reality. We can infer that this valley was formed by glaciation at some point in the past, and that inference is based on the general shape of the valley. Here's another U-shaped valley. As glaciers grind over the bedrock, they scratch it. They leave behind marks and grooves that are called striations. And these striations are important because they reveal the direction that the ice was moving before it melted. You can see them plucking and grinding away the rock beneath, resulting in something like this. And by looking at those striations, we can draw an inference about what direction the ice was moving. And we see them here as well. When a glacier melts, 
it's going to deposit or drop off all of the sediment, all of the pieces of rock and sand and silt and clay that it was carrying with it. And when it does so, it just kind of drops it off. And so we end up with these big piles of this unsorted and unlayered sediment. And we have a term for these sediments, and that's called glacial till. Here you can see big, small, all mixed together. And this is what it looks like in reality. And this serves as further evidence that there was once a glacier in this area. When the glaciers move, they push this till or this unsorted sediment out in front of them, very similar to a bulldozer pushing a pile of soil. When the glaciers then melt, they leave behind these piles of sediment, and these are called moraines. Moraines reveal a lot about a glacier particularly the terminal moraine, shown in this diagram, line XY, this marks the farthest point that a glacier traveled before it receded or melted away. Here's a terminal moraine in reality. This area right here is the till, the unsorted, unlayered sediment that was pushed out in front of the glacier. We can see another uh, terminal moraine right here. Long Island, New York is a great example. It is formed as a result of multiple periods of glaciation, and therefore there are multiple terminal moraines, the Harbor Hill Moraine, the Ronkonkoma Mor Moraine, etc. If we were to look at line EF here from the side as a profile, it would look like this. You would have this first moraine, and then notice this term outwash, which is just some of the material that's been washed out by melting water. And then we have a second period of glaciation that resulted in the Ronkonkoma moraine. Glaciers are the only agent of erosion that are really capable of moving large, large boulders. These are called glacial erratics. So when we see randomly scattered boulders throughout the landscape, we can infer that they were moved there by a glacier. And that's because running water or wind are not capable of moving such large sediments. So here's a glacial erratic, and here's what they look like in reality. The only way these sediments could have gotten there is by being transported by a glacier, frozen in a large sheet of ice. Oftentimes, glaciers will leave behind something called a drumlin, which is simply an elongated hill of sediment. Remember, the sediment would be unsorted and unlaid. What's interesting about drumlins is the shape that they often take as the ice goes up and over and moves the sediment. You end up with this teardrop-shaped hill. And by looking at the shape of the hill, you can determine the direction that the ice flowed. It often flowed towards the flatter side of the hill, the less steep side. Here's a field of drumlins in upstate New York, and by looking at the shapes, we can tell that the ice was moving in this direction. Here's an entire community that appears to have been built right on top of a drumlin, surrounded by farming fields. This diagram shows us the stages in the formation of what's called a kettle or a kettle lake. And this is very common in areas where you've had glaciers. What happens is large pieces of ice break off from the glacier, and then that ice gets buried by some sediment and then eventually melts, leaving behind a hole in the ground known as a kettle. And if it fills with meltwater, it'll be a kettle lake, as seen here and here. When the glaciers melt, we get a lot of meltwater, which forms streams coming off the front end of the glacier. Like all running water, these deposit sorted sediments. So remember, the sediments deposited by the glacier itself are unsorted, that's our till, creating our moraines. But when we have outwash, when we have water that's become liquid and melted, creating streams, then we end up with some sorted sediments. And you can see that in this diagram here. This is an outwash plain, so all of these sediments were deposited by runoff from melting glaciers, also seen here. If we look at New York State, many of the features we see were formed by glaciers during the last ice age, which was about 22,000 years ago. Here we see the movement of the various glaciers during that ice age, all generally moving from Canada down south. We can see lots of features in New York State that have formed as a result of glaciation, including these large fields of drumlins near Oswego, right off of Lake Ontario. Additionally, we see the Great Lakes, which were actually just large U-shaped valleys that have become dammed by sediment and then filled with water. 
very similar to the Finger Lakes of upstate New York, all the result of glaciers. As climate change continues and the planet warms, including the oceans and the atmosphere, we're starting to see the disappearance of large-scale glaciation. If you look at this comparison of the same spot, 60 years apart, you'll notice that the majority of the ice has disappeared. The same thing can be seen here. And we're seeing this happen all over the entire planet. As the ice melts, it adds fresh water to the oceans, causing sea level to rise, which is further complicating our complex atmospheric weather conditions and how climate works on a whole. It's something that scientists are exploring and trying to figure out a solution for as we speak. That's a quick look at glaciers. Thanks very much.